this meeting is being live streamed. I think we might be live now. Yeah, we're online. Okay, there we go. So hello, everyone. I am Billy Autry, and this is Matthias Kurs. We are uh, both representing the Play Framework uh, Steering Committee. Uh, this, this is the inaugural uh, stream about the Play Framework. Uh, the goal of this channel is really to just, you know, to put more of the st st uh, steering committee's face out there to, to help you, uh, I guess, see who is managing the, the Play Framework community but also to interact with us, to ask us questions. Eventually, they will get to the point where we're learning more about play. Um, really, the content here can be whatever you want it to be. Uh, there is a Discord for the Play Framework. I highly encourage you all to join that Discord. Uh, look for, you know, there's a Play Users channel. If you want to contribute, there's a Contributors channel. Um, you know, interact with us in any way that you would like. Um, our plan is to do this, uh, we're not sure how often, maybe once a month or and once every other week, but we're, uh, we're open to hearing opinions there. But uh, yeah, that's, what, that's, uh, that's where we're here today. So my name is Billy Autry. I, uh, I used to work for Lightbend in professional services. I used to teach people Scala and DACA and play, and I came to care very much about the play framework. And, and that's how, uh, you know, by, by those connections and by, you know, knowing, knowing, knowing some of the people involved with the play framework, I was able to, you know, uh, help, you know, I offered my help, you know, my, my time to, to contribute to the play framework. And so here we are today. And, uh, and Matthias, I'll let him introduce himself. Thanks. So hi, everyone. My name is Matthias Kurz. And as you probably, or some may have heard, uh, I'm like very into play. <laughs> like, so basically, I was in the last uh, six, seven, eight years from 2014, I made a lot of contributions to the play framework. And it became more and more uh, next to my freelancing work I was doing, uh, because I just want to fix bugs and uh, implement features and all that stuff. And basically it became a passion to uh, move this project forward. And uh, here we are now, or here I am now. Uh, basically, we, as you might knew or know that um, uh, Lightman asked me if I want to like lead the project because they have other goals now with Arca. And so that's why we found the steering committee and yeah, as Bill, Bill already explained, we wanted to reach out to the community a bit more and mm, like involve people to get started to work on play to provide full grants and all of that. So uh, yeah, as I said, my background is like I was basically doing play projects the last like ten years almost because I was working with play since play one already, and in two thousand fourteen I switched to play two and. In the end, I, I became the number one contributor. And I'm, I really love to work on Play and I really like the framework. It's fun to, 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 um, to just be with the community. I, I met a lot of people from Lightband via Zoom and online, and we had a nice, nice chat. And yeah, that's, that's basically about me. So thanks for joining. And, and today, what we want to show you is like uh, the structure of the play, uh, of the play source code for people. I mean, it's, it will be very easy. It's, it's for advanced users, this probably it's not very interesting. So because we got requests from users, like we want to continue, contri contribute, but we don't know where to start. Some people even have problems to even uh, open a pull request. Uh, like they don't know how, how, how everything works is there like a very strict policy how to set things up so that's what we're going to show today yeah so i guess one of the first things that i've noticed is you know if you're not familiar with the branch strategy and how how the branches are even organized on the play framework uh it can be it can be confusing where i should you know where i should branch off of where should i create my feature branch from and where should i open the pr to so i guess can you talk a little bit about the branch structure first so it's not very difficult, I think. So we have the main branch. That's basically the, the branch we're working on for the next major release. So it should it should be in a, I mean, it should <laughs> compile and run the test actually. So when you clone it, it should work. 
um, but it isn't ready for production. So it's you shouldn't build it to yourself and, and just put it out in the wild. So that's not a good idea. Um, and we have all the stable branches. For example, the current stable branch, branch is 2.8.x. You, you will see it anyway. And uh, on this branch, this is the stable branch where we just um, uh, basically add bug, uh, co co commit bug, bug fixes or small features which are not breaking binary compatibility. So, uh, so basically, if you want to fix a bug in the stable branch, you should open pull requests against that stable branch. Uh, usually, we take care about forward porting it to the main branch and also the other way around. Like if you, if you commit to the master branch, to the main branch, and this is a good, uh, let's say it's a nice feature, which is compatible, binary compatible, backwards compatible. We can usually sometimes we, we backport it to the, to the stable branch. Yes. And basically, when you open a pull request, pull request, it's not very, we don't have like strict policies or something like that. We don't have to include, uh, I don't know, issue numbers or whatever. You don't have to open an issue before you open a pull request. You don't have to do uh, even. I mean, even this uh, template you see when you open a pull request or an issue, it's just a hint. You you can fill it out, and it's very nice to fill it out for us actually. But if you're sure what you're talking about, you can just delete and just write your own text. So we are we are not picky about the things. So we want to make it easy for everyone and not to be yeah to have too much, too much. I should say in English like formal parameters. So yeah. I got a question in the chat. Uh, are either of us paid to work on the play framework? Um, I don't take any pay. I just donate my time and donate my effort. So as you have seen, we have the open collective now. Um, so we get sponsor money from sponsors since like a couple of months. And the plan is uh, that I want, if, if, if everything turns out nice, I would like to work full time on the play framework. As you can see, in the, if, you, if you have a look in the history of the Git, uh, of my comments or pull requests, which is whatever, you will see I invested a lot of time in the last like six years in the play fr framework already. Um, uh, last September, when Lightband basically started to look for someone else uh, or, or some other, <laughs> whoever wanted to take, to take over the, the framework, uh, it was basically the idea my idea of, of from actually someone told me that's a good idea to move to open collective and i, I had a look at this and like nice so because it was getting so much for me to contribute to the framework time-wise because i have family and kids as well uh, i thought it's if 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 i'm going to contribute further i'm i want to get paid for that so we do have some money on the open collective right now and i'm going to start uh, to pay out money to myself and in the end hopefully somewhere around this year um I would, it would be nice to be able to have enough sponsors to actually get paid on a monthly basis um like if for like a full-time job a good salary for a full-time job all the others from the steering committee actually they are they have jobs <laughs> like full-time jobs and they using play everyone has a background using play or using play now in the in the jobs in the in the, in the daily work Yes, and I I will pay out money for from the Open Collective for the work I'm investing right now, and also I will pay out money for like I ordered a, a MacBook now. <laughs> I will I will pay the MacBook from the money for Open Collective and all those things. Yeah, I it might be interesting to note that there is possibility in the future for other contributors to uh, or or mm -hmm. collaborators to put bounties on specific bugs. And so if other people want to get paid. I guess to work on the play framework, uh, you know, look out in the future for possible bounties, and you might be able to, yeah. to you know, get a little bit of that as well. Yeah. Also, we have like three premium sponsors right now. Like as you see, on can see the website, the the logos, and we have definitely coming up other companies. Like we have one. I'm, I I won't say name, but um, they are hundred percent committed to. To, um, to become a premium sponsor. It's just a matter because it's just a matter how they 
basically put money in the open collective because they don't want to use the credit card. So this will take another couple of weeks until this is official. And after that, they want to reach out to other companies as well to get more sponsorship. Yeah. Cool. So good question. Thanks. Um, the, um, I guess getting back to the versions and everything. So let's say that I, you know, I put out a PR that targets the 2.7.x branch, but I also know that I want it to put it on 2.8.x and maybe also on main. How do I sort of, is there, is there anything in place for me to migrate those, that change to all of those other branches automatically? So how we did it until, or, or, or how we do it right now is like you, the best it is you have my pull request against the 2.7.x branch. And then right now we have Mergeify set up as like a GitHub bot or a GitHub application, I know. And we will basically tell Mergeify after we merge the pull request in that stable branch, we tell Mergeify to just uh, migrate this or well, open, I don't know, migrate the pull request to the, to the next stable branch or to the development branch. And if there are any conflicts, we will, we will uh, just fix the conflict, conflicts ourselves. Or you also welcome to fix the conflicts. And if you really want to do a nice job for us, <laughs> you can just open, you can, after the pull request was merged on the stable branch, you can go ahead and, and say, okay, you just cherry pick the, the comet or the comets, whatever on the next stable branch and fix the conflicts yourself and then just provide another pull request for the other branches. That probably is the nicest thing to do for us because it's less work for us. Of course, it depends how, what, what's changing. It's just a small thing usually. But because it's a stable branches, we, there shouldn't be too much new features on them. So it should usually, us, usually be easy to follow the plot them, except maybe then if a lot of things changed on the development branch, but yes. But does this answer your question? Okay, very good. I'm not saying much if I the best thing, but it's just, it was set up a couple of years ago and we use it now, so. Yeah, yeah, I've seen the Mergeify tags in a couple of places where, you know, Mergeify backport, I think is the main one that I've seen. Yeah, yeah so, okay, cool. Um, I guess getting into the PRs a little bit, I know that there's CI CD set up on that, and we're in the process of moving from Travis to GitHub Actions, right? Yes, Travis will be gone very soon. This is my next task. Actually, thanks to Sergey, who helped with this already and provided some nice progress, I just hadn't the time to basically finish the thing up or everything up. But we want to completely get rid of Travis and just move to GitHub Actions. And we also want to make the re release process much simpler, uh, much more simpler. <laughs> so wh when we create tag, uh, the re like the new, uh, yeah, if we create a new release, we just want to create tag and then we want to, the whole release process should start by itself, like run the tests and everything and also publish the artifacts to main the central. So that's definitely coming as well, which makes auto maintains much more simpler for us. Okay, cool. Maybe we should crack into some code now um, and just kind of start mm -hmm. talking through what what is in the main play framework repo because there's a lot of repos I know, but uh, the the main one that's that's sort of the heart of the play framework is probably the first one worth exploring. So uh, maybe we should take a look at that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think it's the best if I uh, share my screen and we just have a look. We will have a look around. Um, okay. I hope this will work out nice. So you should see my screen now, actually. Yeah, I see. Yep, I see it. So this is the play, the main repository of the play framework. Um, where does, where should we start? Let's see. Okay, let's start in the build.spt. Um, that's uh, naturally where SPT projects are, uh, basically start, where you define projects. As you can see at the bottom, there's like the play framework project, um, which aggregates other projects. And so basically the, the structure on the left the, 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 in, the, the, in the file tree, the folders you can see, they pretty much resemble the play, the, all the projects in the, in the build SPT. 
so like yeah i don't know play java project like play java it's defined here you can see it's in the in core slash play java and this is on the in the file tree right here play java so i mean i think i think the best if if you have a look around by yourself and, and check out how the structure so as you can see i mean do you have any questions um no or, i think that makes sense so it sounds like you're saying that you know there's each of these projects or sub projects corresponds to specific folders and so you know yes. there's that play test projects is like if i'm looking to fix something in play test projects then i can find the svt rule for it here um line 177 and it's found in test kit slash play dash test exactly yes yeah okay and if you're if you're using spt like if you start up spt you will see that all these projects which we have, which we have defined here you can also of course move around uh, within them in spt if it comes up and so each of these projects the, these correspond to uh several jars that are published right like each one of these is a exactly jar. yes okay okay this is taking a while <laughs> <laughs> it always starts first yeah <laughs> it has to I'm, I'm really looking forward to yeah to my new notebook <laughs> <laughs> something a little more recently built. Yes. Yeah. So here we go. If you uh, like projects, you see all of all of these projects are here actually. And we're now in the main like parent project, the play frame project. Yeah. And, and that play framework is the aggregate one, right? That like if you do which we yeah. saw on the bottom here. Yeah. So. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Now I see here that like the um, I see there's there's no explicit dependencies. So if you know if if I'm very new to SVT, then I would expect to see library dependencies plus equals you know this yes. dependency. But I'm just seeing lists here and and you know a lot of shortcuts. Where where is all that stuff? Okay, let's see for example this one of the caffeine cash project. Uh, the dependencies if you click on it are in the dependency in the Scala file in the project folder. <laughs> so all the dependencies, if you want to upgrade the dependency, you want to see which project has which dependency, you can find them here in this object, I think it is. And so basically we have two um, files where we define dependencies. That's like we see here, the dependencies Scala, and also in the plugins um, in the project, plugins file, which is here on the top. Uh, we do define some SPT plugins, which we also share with the play project. That means usually if you have a SPT plugin, it usually, it usually doesn't get published because it's just for the local development environment. But uh, thanks to SPT, what's called uh, build info, it's a project like if you have, a, if, if you have the SPT native package, we also, we just don't use it for play to, we also uh, publish it. Uh, where is it? Like you can see here, that's the, we share the version basically with, as dependency as well. Okay, I see. So you can, so that allows us to build the SPT plugins that are in this code base and then publish them locally so we can use them in different modules. Is that what you're saying? Yes, but they are also used as um, for end user projects, basically. Mm -hmm. As far as a, like as as SPT native package, if you if you create a new play project, I think the SPT native package is also included out of the box. And that's if you want to change the version, a version, or want to upgrade, or want to see which version you're using, that's basically this version in the plugins in the plugins.spt file. So okay. The, the, I think the takeaways here, you have two files where dependencies are defined. And that's the dependencies and the plugins SPT. Yeah, perfect. Okay, that, that jives with a lot of other um, Scala projects I've seen in the past, and especially the way that Aka projects are kind of built. So that makes yes, sense. Yes, it's, yeah. And uh, I don't know if people, for people which are new to SPT, uh, all, all the things you, uh, 
put in the project folder, like you can access from the access from the build.spt. So there's like one unit, one compilation. I don't know how how to describe, but the project, yeah, all, all, all the things like if you have release the release object, you you can actually access this uh, object and in its members from the build SPT. You have to import it though at the top, right? Isn't that? Yes, probably. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think the project folder is compiled first, and then the build SPT. Exactly. You can access it as as a, exactly. as a package or an object or something. And yeah, you can. I'm pretty much. Yeah. Cool. There's yeah. like two two compilations that happen. There's like when you do a when you do a build at the SVT level, you know, at, at the base level, it, it builds project folder first, and then it goes to the build SVT to read the rules and and do everything. Okay. Um, so I guess speaking of the the SVT plugin. Uh, where are those SPT plugins? You know, because I know that if I'm using the Play framework, I'm I'm using the Play SPT plugin to set a bunch of rules for me and to to you know have the different folder structure because Play has a different folder structure than most Scala projects. It, not everything is in source bin Scala in a Play project. So where exactly. does all that live? This is in uh, yeah in display uh, object. Uh, I mean these are all okay. Let, let me start. So. Play provides you various different um, plugins, SPT auto plugins. So what does so it means? Um, if you if you create a new Play project and um, project and use in the project plug plugin SPT, you enable uh, you basically you, you pull in the Play project and then in the build SPT you enable the, the plugin. So um, this uh, we have. All, all the plugins are defined in this file in the play.scala in the SPT plugin folder in the dev mode. Yeah, subtree. So basically, um, we have different plugins and all uh, they depend on each other, which means um, the lower, for example, play scala. If you use play scala, it means it requires also play web. Uh, and it also has some default settings. If you have, if you look inside them, you can see. Okay, it just uh, it adds some template imports for Twill. Um, if you don't want to use Play Scala and you want to, because maybe you don't want to use Twill, you can just use Play Service, for example. As you can see, Play Service basically is the uh, smallest unit of plugin you can use. That's basically the the root of all plugins. So if you have a project and you don't want to use like Roots, as you can see, there's the roots compiler, and you don't want to use Twill and all that stuff. You can just use Play Service, which means you just replace the uh, Play Scala with Play Service. And as you can see, the this like a tree, and each each plugin adds its own settings. For example, if you if you look at Play Service, you will see um, this. Yeah, it adds its own imports and so on, and. Uh, each plugin, which um, inherited from another plugin, it adds its own settings, its own it, 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 its own imports, and so on. And so, if I wanted to sort of customize and choose which of these auto plugins I wanted to use, and I really knew what I was doing, I could just mix several of these auto plugins and sort of uh, add them in. But I don't have to because Play Service does a lot of it for me, right? Exactly. Play service is, is meant for people who just want to get started. And usually you, you use as a play service, yeah, it's 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 the smallest thing you can have. It's just as you can see, it requires child packaging, so you can package the application. Uh, I don't really know what's in here. Like as you can it it basically it sets up <laughs> yeah, the, the smallest thing so everything fits together. Like uh, it defines uh, the main class, for example. When you run the in, in dev mode, I mean, uh, in, in prod mode, like it, it defines the main class, which, which main class to run when you run application and mm -hmm. all of that. So that's done by the play service. It, it defines default ports and all, this, all of that stuff. And all other services on top just add their own settings, like Twill imports, the default imports, and things like that. OK, interesting. 
And so these these settings are available. They're set in, but but if I wanted to override them for whatever reason, then I could I could override. Yeah, them. you can just override them in, in your progress team. Like if you want to change the, there are other ways as well. But if you want to change the play default port, you could just say play, play default port equals one to three, for example. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. And so if if there's a problem with the with the plugins, it looks like I'm in the dev mode folder and then SBT dash plugin. Um, what are what are some of the other things that are in this dev mode folder? It looks like it looks like there's some other interesting, I guess, uh, additional supporting plugins that that are re referenced by this SBT plugin, like the routes compiler. Exactly. Um, if you look at the source code in the like you said in dev mode folder, dev mode means this as far as I know, these are all SBT plugins, and all the other um, all the other libraries or folders here, they are basically normal runtime libraries. And um, so as you can see, we have a root compiler, which basically passed root file and translated to a nice color file, which which get passed when a request comes in. Um, then this, okay, the play docs is not interesting. It's like, I think this was 100% true anymore. For the, of course, for the documentation, um, I think this is, in the past, play ship with the documentation inside, so you could access on the, the documentation on local host. I think this is from from it, and ah. yeah. Then we have run support and building. Um, building basically is a project. It has particular plugins, well, I think, but it was some helper, which uh, okay, core. It it handles basically the link from the from the play application to SPT. So that's done, I think, there are some components playing together here. <clears throat> so basically, if you run evolutions, for example, and you see a nice screen, like you want to apply evolution, like the SQL migration scripts, then you basically hit yes, but that's basically, that's a, that's a request to the play framework, and now play wants to re uh, restart the dev server, which is done. Uh, you 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 basically want to kind of tell SPT to kind of restart. So and that's where building comes in and where you communicate from with from the play application with SPT. So okay. that's what building kind of does. It's like the link from SPT to play. Okay. So so in in play, I know that one of the main features that we like to talk about is it is had a like sort of hot reload. So you can you exactly. can easily make changes and it would recompile automatically. Yes, right? yes, of course. Yeah, I'm I'm too far here already. I think. Yeah, <laughs> but, and, yeah. And so that's what yeah. build link does. Is it it allows that? I, I think yeah. Um, I, I can't tell you exactly now each each thing, but I think that's the build link with, together with the run support and things like that. This this set all of this up. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very cool. Interesting. That's super helpful. Um, so okay. If, if you want to like. Um, I can explain a little bit. Like if you if you op if you run SPT and then you uh, type run and hit enter, so basically what 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 this is in devel this is development mode. So what does what it means is that you basically run SPT task. So uh, I think it's a run task. So this is also like in the preserve setting. <clears throat> you can see. Uh, it, this is a SPT thing, it, like keys dot run, and we set it to play run to the default run task actually. So you can see uh, the play run task, and what it does is it basically starts a dev server, development server. So that's that's basically the the entry point in a in a development application. So the yeah, and then here you see there's a dev mode server. It starts in dev mode and it basically provides your application, starts up the whole thing. And this is all done from an SPT run task, actually. In production okay. mode, this is basically you you run a Java application with the main, uh, main method. That's what I showed before with the main class, where to find a main class. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so I know one of the stumbling blocks that beginners often run into is like, you know, when you're when you're in SVT, you do run and it runs dev mode, and it allows you to do the hot reload and all those nice features. But exactly. there's settings that are sort of ignored in dev mode that 
you suddenly run into when you try to run it in prod mode. And most people don't yeah. realize you could do run prod to load those different settings. Yeah. And and so this actually shows yeah. you those different settings, right? Yes. And that's, uh, I can, I mean, I can tell you exactly which settings these are. It's like all the settings which are in uh, play dot, like, okay, let's have a look at the, at the configs. Like, all the configurations which play ships with, they're all in the reference call, in, in various reference call files. So each project defines its own reference calls, under, usually under each, its own namespace. So for example, if you have, um, I don't know, um, that's the main probably, the, that's the core configs. So if you're looking for a conf, you can always just have a look in a reference conf and you will probably find them. Or oh, it's also interesting to just have a look around. If you, even if you're not developing on the play source code itself, but you, if you are working on a play application, it's probably a good idea to, to once scroll through all the reference conf so you know what you can, what, what you can configure. Yeah. Um, uh, and the thing is in dev mode, um, why some settings are not available, this is because I mean, this is just about the server configs. And that's because uh, in dev mode, uh, let's see, let's use another one because it's a bit empty. It's the archer. Ah, so I just overrides. <laughs> just a moment, please. Let's see. Um, play net server example. Or let, let's, okay, play server. So in dev mode, what happens is, uh, as far as I remember, the, 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 the thing is, usually the server gets its configuration from the application. And, but in, in the development mode, the application starts up after the server started up. So it, it can't receive all the, uh, the server configs in your application conf. It, it, can't, it, it can't reach them because the application gets started after you start, after the server started. That's because the application reloads each time you make a change. So the application shuts down and restarts, the application shuts down, shuts down and restarts. So all, all configs in play.server will not be, that you define in your application conf will not work in development mode. But it works in production because in production, the application starts up before the server starts up. And then the server can ask the application, okay, please give me the, con the user conf, the, like the, the configuration. Does that make okay. sense? Yeah, no, I think that That's does make sense. That's maybe too specific already. Yeah, yeah. That's actually pretty interesting. That's, that explains several of the, I guess, weird situations I know I run into with people in the past when trying to run things and like... But yeah, yeah, that, that yeah. makes total sense. Yeah, and that's why we have a workaround, like you, you have the play keys and you can hear you set, um, ah, sorry, I can't remember right now. Dev settings, exactly. And in this dev setting, you can see you can add settings in the build SPT. Of course, they're only used in, in development because usually you, you, you put all the settings in the application conf file. So if you want to set a server setting in development mode, you should put them in, in the in build SPT, for example, in dev settings. And oh, then the, this see. will be also uh, seen by the server in dev mode. So that's a very common mistake people made and, and make and ask why, why, why is the setting not working. Yes. Are you, my uh, my Zoom crashed. I thought I thought I lost okay. it. I no, no, it's I... cool. I'm still online. Yes. Okay, well, very good. Uh, sorry about that. That's cool. Okay. So, where we well, you have any questions? Um, I don't think I have any other questions there. I think we could talk for a long time about the plugin, but I think there's a couple of other things that are probably interesting to go into, which is like you know. You know where's where's the heart? Where's the meat of of the play framework? Where you know because when I'm writing, you know when I'm writing a play service, you know I've got to write you know my controller and my controller has a bunch of action builders in it, you know to sort of describe the actions and you know call the views for the routes and things like that. So where's where's the heart of the API of of, of the play framework? Um, I mean basically it's in core play. Uh, 
there are various places. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot, a lot of projects which handle various aspects of the framework. But I mean, the core is probably in play in the core play folder, which is uh, available always. Basically, um, as you can see, it, it, I mean, that's the, how should I say, the smallest part of the of the whole framework, which is available to every everything. What's important to say here for, probably is that um, the namespace for play Scala applications is play.api.something. And if you're using play Java, you don't use the play.api. You use you import play something like for example, if we uh, built in module, that's very interesting to show because you can see here that we have the play API inject, and that's for the that's provided for play Scala projects, and we have play inject. That's you won't see this if you have a play Scala project. You only see this. I mean, you 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 don't you, you don't use it by yourself, but that's <clears throat> used only for and also export only to play Java projects. And to continue here, the built-in module is very interesting uh, because that's where basically the I mean for choose and all the dependency injection, everything is wired together. <clears throat> for example, excuse me, like you can see, this is a module and. Basically, this is where everything is wired together. When you, for example, inject, uh, these are the basic modules for a play Scala application, basically. Okay, like okay. If, if you inject an uh, in executor, that's where it looks up uh, how, how, to, uh, how to instantiate it, you know? Okay, so this is how I can have a very light sort of um, hello world application and it doesn't, have all these i don't i don't have to define all of these in, uh, injections for all of these different rules and, and things because these are already defined provided by default in in this module exactly yes yeah okay but uh, if i, I want think, to yeah. bind something then i can i can bind something to override these with a different instance exactly yes to. you could in theory and also in practice you can just go ahead and say okay i'm i will bind my own module or my own component to you know Ecto system for example uh, you can override all these modules, I think, should be possible. But yeah, usually the main ones or the core ones usually don't make so much sense to write. But but it makes sense, for example, I mean, the whole, the whole uh, how should I say, the whole thing is built like this. Like if you have, if you have a look at the cache in, um, modules, like we have to play cache, that's basically like an interface. And uh, we have three concrete, concrete implementations of it. So basically, uh, that's also set up as modules, and you just and then you bind an implementation to it, and yeah. that's all, how all of that works. Basically. I mean, that's software engineering. <laughs> yeah. So this is just the the, the API basically. essentially, so that I can exactly. say you know my cache dot you know cache this request, and then it will. Uh, it will based on which jar I plugged in and my dependencies, it will bind yeah. to it. I mean, you don't. Ex yes, you say library dependencies, and you use okay ha cache, and then it sets up everything for you. I so forget. I do, do these concurrent implementations automatically bind themselves if I include the jar? Yes, usually okay. they bind themselves. I mean, okay. it's up to the developer. If if you have a third party module, uh, but it's enough. We usually bind itself. Yes. Okay. So like if I'm here, okay. here, here okay. you can see, for example, the play H A K A A H A K. Sorry. E H cache, yeah. Yeah, e -H -cache. <laughs> you you see that it uh, enables it this module and this module basically wires everything together again, like we have in build module in the build in module, and that's how also third party uh, modules provide the service to the user basically. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, so it looks like I have options here to, you know, if I'm writing my own module for my own cache or whatever, or I'm trying to fix something with one of these, it's not binding, then I can, I can look at the config and I can also look at the code that's doing the binding and see what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. 
Um, there was a bunch of other folders in core. I guess, uh, do you have like a brief, a brief thing to say about any of those that are, that are interesting? <clears throat> I mean, usually the name says, says it all, I think. I mean, I, I can, of course, deep dive and, but like play exceptions, that's for example, uh, kind of special exceptions, which you see, which helps play to display nice error message in the browser. When there's an error, it displays in the browser at this line and so on. That, that's what play exception does. So if inside the play source code, we throw these exceptions and this, it will be caught at some place and then to render nicely in the, in the screen. So that's play exception. Play choose, I think, I mean, it's self-explanation. Uh, it chooses the dependency injection. Yeah. Yeah, integration tests. Um, then we have play Java. That's basically pulled in when you have a play Java project. I, I showed this before with the building module, for example. Like that's mm -hmm. where this research okay. or play specific. Uh, so Java, sorry, Java specific uh, libraries. Play logback if you enable play logback micro benchmarks. But this is for this is just for development play. This is this is not some, this play micro. There, uh, there's some projects projects which don't even get published to Maybe Central. I think play micro bench is one of them. This is just a project which runs on the CI server. So we see that we're not slowing down the whole thing. Okay. Okay. So basically, it's a way for us to sort of quality gate to make sure that a change that we made doesn't dramatically slow down the service. Yes. To be honest, I I, I don't I never really touched it. This but they, are, they don't fail the test, so yeah, it's, it's a good thing to have. Yeah, play streams, it's ACA related. I know why it's right now. Yeah, but, yeah, this is if you're trying to, if you want to stream files or, or bits, or if you want to deal with, I think WebSockets deals with play streams too, doesn't it? Um, I think this is more about the whole, you can see accumulator, uh, okay, yeah. so this is just the underlying that all of those things use. The yes, ex or... execution is if you have the trampling execution context, which just jumps. Is execution context? I think uh, what was it? It it to set, stay on the same thread when you basically you don't want to have thread uh, threads, which I think when, yeah. So if 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 some component or a method or function requires execution the context you can use the execution this trampling context and it stays on the same uh thread and there's some helper like uh, yeah well for i mean it's just <laughs> to to develop the project <laughs> it's, yeah uh, yeah I, I think it makes sense because accumulator it's, it's is also really internal like... things which is uh, usually just used into as well and yeah I, i've looked at this stuff before and i like accumulator it's it's whole the whole idea there is that you're accumulating bytes over the wire and you're doing something with them. And yeah. so it makes sense that you don't want that to get passed yeah. around to different yeah. to different execution contexts because then you know none of them have the whole picture. You want the same one to collect all the same bytes because it might be a file or it might be you know something something big. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah, I I think I have touched this libraries too much. And yeah, usually I mean I, I think I'm pretty pretty much confident with like 80 or 90 percent of the code, but some of them I just use myself and if there's a bug it just you know debug so much down to understand what's going on yeah 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 that makes sense okay um so let me see here we haven't gone over persistence yet uh what's what's in there uh so basically that's uh as you can see there is a component for gwc and that's and here's the same story like having cash before like play gwc is basically uh provides interfaces and then we have uh, implementations uh, of it with concrete classes and concrete um, yeah concrete uh, objects basically so that's what what's in here like if you want to use if you want to bind to database you enable play gpc and you're good to go and we also have cheap gpa for child projects like you can use hibernate or something else and there's also play Java GDBC. That's basically the Java implementation of the play GDBC interfaces. Yeah. And that's the same story again. It wires everything together. 
with the module and then have a complete implementation of it. So, so I think it's good if someone is interested in the source code to just have a look in this uh, the structure because I think so. Usually it's self explanatory it, 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 it explains itself. Yeah. But it's a, it's, it's a good start to have a look in the reference conf, and then you see, like, if you have a look in Blind Shower, should we see this the reference conf? Yeah, main resources. And here you can see again, it enables the plated B module, and so on and so on. And then yeah. this, yeah. So basically, this is, if, if you can come up basically with your own GDBC, implementation, to, then you would probably implement all the interfaces from the Bleach GDBC mm -hmm. uh, components. And then basically someone else who's using Play, you, he, can, uh, he or she can just uh, switch the Play implementation with your implementation that you provide. So yes, that's, it's always the same story actually, same like okay. as before. Yeah, I think the hint about, that you said earlier about there's, there's APIs and then concrete implementations that are sort of swapped around is a really good hint for sort of thinking about how a lot of these are sort of organized because yeah. persistence is that way. Um, I think that transport and web might be that way, uh, right? Because transport, transport is- Transport is, we have, okay, transport is a client. It's a, a cross, I mean, it's a HTTP client basically mm -hmm. on the client side. These are basically, there's a there's an, a project which is called play dash ws and this is just basically a wrap around this project so we i think it it used to um reside inside the place uh, the main paper story is source code but it was um externalized as its own project and it's basically uh, i have touched as well as too much but i think this is basically wraps this library to work nicely with play. So I think to, you, so you can check like a, a web, like the website's clients and make requests. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's um, I, we've I've used it in a couple of places. And if if you need a cheap and easy HTTP client and it's already you know you've already got play in in your code base for whatever reason, then it's sometimes cheap and easy to just use the play WS client to to spawn requests out to whatever you're doing. So, if, because you don't need a whole service, but you've, you've already got play in scope. So just use play WS in that situation. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Then we have the very interesting thing here is the server part. So uh, play provides right now still provides two different server backends. Uh, by, de by default, this is the, the play Arca. So Arca HTTP is used by default and uh, historically, there was the Netis server, which still is. I mean, there's actually a reason to not ship it. Uh, we may we, we thought about to externalize it its own project, but it's pretty much it's pretty stable. I think even people use it because, of course, it was the default until play. I don't know, two point four, two point five. Can't remember. Yeah. But it means it's the same story again. Like you have to play server, which provides the like interfaces, like the parent project, and then we just implemented two different um, server implementations on top of this. So you can very easily swap out the backend server. Yeah, basically it's just enabling or disabling the SPD plugin it provides. So the default it's Arca HTTP and you can just disable it and switch to the native backend. Yeah. The reason here is, um, of course, because Arca HTTP was, I mean, was kind of a new project. Well, uh, but Netty was, of course, I mean, Netty is much older. So Net Play .zero started with Netty as the server backend, and then Arca HTTP came up, and then uh, Play migrated us to Arca HTTP to use it as a default. And so, yeah, we sh Netty is still shipped. It's also good because sometimes. I mean, in the past, actually, if there was a bug in Arca HTTP, people could, could just switch back to the native backend. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but, I, but Arca HTTP has, has gotten, I guess it's gained some traction. It's, it's more mature now, so. I yes, like, yeah, it's much more, yeah. of course, yeah. it's mature now. Yeah, and then it looks like there's an HTTP too. I guess that's probably there for gRPC support, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a HTTP two um 
it enables the HTTP2 HTTP service on top of the ArcHTTP server, basically. That's I mean, it's really, easy. Huh? It's just a config. <laughs> it's just one config, yeah. Yeah. It, it basically it when you enable this uh, plugin because it's so <clears throat> it's in the build SPD I think it's it's set up an SPD plugin if I remember correctly and then basically it, it just pulls in this config which 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 tells the Arca HTTP server to enable the HTTP two uh, config so it's enabled but I think I don't even know is I think it's still experimental in the Arca HTTP. So that's uh, I, th I think I don't I don't know very concretely, but I but Aka GRPC seems to be gaining more traction as well. I know that they've gone 1.0 and GRPC yeah. sits on top of HTTP2. And so I think that it's I think that when I had left Lightband, it was becoming you know fully supported. Um, I you know don't take my word for it. I I don't I don't work for Lightband anymore. But uh, they're, you know, given how much support they have are throwing for throwing out there for gRPC in general, I wouldn't be surprised if this is becoming very stable and has a lot of attention from them. Yeah. Um, cool. So, yes. Okay. Um, okay, that's the transport folder. <laughs> um, what's what's that scripts folder? I I, I seem to recall <clears throat> that has something to do with the SVT plugins, right? No, the scripts folder. Uh, oh, okay. It's basically is used, is mainly used by the CI server. Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> so basically, um, the right now we're still using Clevis. If you have a look at the trace config, you will see that it just runs scripts from within the script folder. So <clears throat> that's basically it. I mean, it, it's it's as you can see, okay. you have a publish local. It publishes the uh, whole project locally. Like on the CI server, you can also. I just made a pull request like two hours ago <laughs> to fix the script that you can also run them locally. So, for example, if you have the channel here, <clears throat> where I am now, let's go back. Uh, for example, you can also use these scripts locally to run the test, for example, if you see script test. Now it says you need to pass the Scala version because it has to know which uh, which uh, Scala version you want to test against. I'm not trying this now, but if you run this, all the tests, yeah, which are here, which are inside the framework, will run. So that's a good way to test locally. Uh, yeah, your changes. For example, I mean, these are all just it's just wrap around SPT. For example. It's called. It's it's running. It's basically it's running SPT tests. That's all it does. You can also just spin up SPT and run test. It's the same thing. Uh, okay, that makes sense um, because yeah. it's important for uh, for the play framework to support multiple Java versions and multiple Scala versions because exactly, yes. you don't so, know who's going to be yeah. using what. Yeah. Uh, what's interesting probably is this local PR validation. It's recommended if you. I mean, a lot of people, including me, usually not always, just push pull requests without validating too much. But of course, it's nicer if you validate locally before and like use CI as your, I don't know, like you just push each, like you wait for the error and push to change, wait for error and push to change. It, it, it's probably easier and also fast if you just test the whole thing locally. And what uh, local PR validation does, it just validates the source code if if it's formatted correctly, if uh, the headers are here, and and things like that. So basically, like I said, it's Travis, uh, the CI server, which we will change to GitHub Actions, will use the scripts to run which, to run, yeah, tests to run validations, micro benchmarks, for example, all of that. So if you if you don't know how to run tests, for example, you basically can just have a look in inside these scripts. I mean, if you know SPT, it's it's the basic SPT code like test or mm -hmm. a scripted, for example. Uh, yes. Okay. Very cool. Well, I, I think mean, we're at the top of the hour almost. Uh, do you have any final words or any thought? Any final thoughts? Um. 
So not really, I hope. I mean, the thing is, I'm pretty much, I'm very deep in this code, you know? Like, mm -hmm. so if this was too fast for someone, uh, please reach out to us, ask questions. We have the discussion forum. If you really want to get started, we can, uh, I mean, we can make another session and just explain and go deeper in, this, in certain scenarios, in certain parts of the code. I can maybe try to live code something so that you can see how, yeah, how I work or how, how things fit together. I mean, this, I don't know, maybe this was a fast, was too fast for someone, but yes, uh, well, like I, I said, if, if you want to contribute, just contribute, just make pull requests and all of that. Yeah. Uh, I think we also want to set up nicer uh, docs for newcomers where we are, we explain how to, yeah, how to validate the code, how to run tests locally. What, for example, I didn't explain what the script the tests. I think we can make your own session about testing, for example, how how tests are set up and things like that. Yeah, uh, we got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, well, a couple of people saying thanks. This was very helpful. And then uh, we got a question from one person asking, what's the best way to know what the roadmap is for the future of the Play Framework? What are we working on? Or what are we telling people to work on? Yeah, so basically we have a milestone, which is two. 2.9 in the GitHub repository. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically it for the 2.9. The main thing we want to have on the 2.9 release is uh, Java 17 support, which is basically there already. There's not, not, nothing to do. And we want to have move to Scala, uh, provide also Scala 3 support. And there are some things like up, make, we want to make use of the latest Dark HTTP uh, dependency and things like that. Actually, I think it's not too much, but there are some things which need to be done. I started to go over the pull requests uh, on the issues on the and and try to label them like good for. I think I don't know what's the name of the label. Good for like, beginner or something like that. Something like that, yeah. Good first person. But good first I think PR. I was. Pardon? I think it's, maybe it's good first PR something like that. Something yeah. like that, yeah. yeah. And you can have a look at them. Uh, yes. Uh, have a look at the uh, 2.9 milestone. And for example, I would need help uh, if someone wants to uh, upgrade to Arca HTTP, the, 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 the latest major version, you're well welcome to do this, for example, things like that. Or uh, um, yes, or just reach out on the discussion forum or in Discord, just ask what, what you can you can tell us what your ability is or how what's your experience and maybe we find some progress you can work on it or how how you can help yeah i know like the thing is my time was limited in the last few months there's a lot of things i wanted to do and I still want to do i'm very motivated like the rest of us but time is limited also like i had other things to do, other projects and family and kids and all that stuff so i really hope within the next months or uh, this year that everything fits together and turns out and I can probably in the next few months spend much more time on play. Yeah. And I mean, the cool thing is not that and we keep it alive and we definitely going to release 2.9. Like we are, we definitely push things forward. Okay, we're, great. We're going step by step and. Yeah, um, probably another thing that's gonna happen is, you know, we have, we do have regular meetings with the uh, steering committee and kind of talk about, you know, just over, over oversight things. But we also talk about, you know, possibly doing releases and we we chat regularly on discord so you know we are on there there's uh, there's other members that are not here that are on there uh, Renato is on uh, Greg Methvin Sergey uh, they're all on on discord and they answer questions and so we're active uh, if you have suggestions if you want to see certain things in this in this channel or you want to see us talk about certain things or you just want to chat you know please please give us feedback on on discord and and or in the uh, discussion forum on GitHub, and and uh, we will we will entertain any any requests, any any anything you might have to yeah. say. We'll, we're glad to hear it. Yeah, if I want to say something like I know a lot, some people provide pull requests, and uh, some of them I haven't I, I didn't have time yet to like comment or merge them or whatever. But I, I will try my best. Everyone else from from team will try its best to finally comment on them. So please. 
like we're here and we're doing work and we're going step by step, but don't worry if, you're, if a pull request is not like, I don't know, if you have the feeling no one is looking at them, I, I'm pretty much aware of all the pull requests which are there. And I know that some of them, even if for two months later, I will pick them up and I will work on them and I will we'll get them at some point. Okay, cool. Yeah, we got a little catch up to do, but yeah, we're there. Everything will be looked at. I, uh, I look at stuff too. So yeah. All right, great. Thanks for your time, Matthias. Or Matthias. Yeah, thanks. I sure. talked to you. Yeah. <laughs> now we have to figure out how to turn off this. Okay, so stop screen sharing. All right. See you guys. Thanks. <laughs>